Good evening, I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Professor Stephen F. Cohen, New York University, Russian History at Princeton as well, Emeritus, joins me in the headlines before we turn to Steve's new piece just up at The Nation about the crisis in Ukraine. The headlines are dire. Right now, we have information from, uh, from eastern Ukraine that the power station at Slavyansk, that's a city that's been under siege for some time in the Donetsk region, is blacked out, has been attacked or destroyed in some fashion. Very unlikely that they can repair the electrical grid. This city is blacked out. There are reports throughout eastern Ukraine of blackout. At the same time, we have a report of a downed aircraft in southeastern uh, Ukraine, militiamen of the self-proclaimed Lugansk People's Republic have shot down a Sukhoi Su-27. The reason this aircraft was over Lugansk, the reason the self-defense forces have fired back is because within these last hours, the, the elected president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, has declared on his own the end to the ceasefire that was in place within these next hours in fact it's coming the second of july in europe right now the foreign ministers of of russia of germany have been invited to Ger uh, uh, to berlin by frank walter steinmeier the foreign minister of germany and they russia france uh, uh ukraine and Germany will join, not the United States, noticeably not the United States, to discuss the end of the ceasefire. That's enough to point to the fact that whatever was in place these last days is gone. The shooting, the violence, the darkness, the refugee columns begin again. Steve, a very good evening to you. The trouble in Ukraine you underline in your piece of the nation is a story that must be traced to the United States and to Washington and to the silence of Washington. How so, Steve? Good evening to you. Well, John, and I seek your advice here. Uh, we who do what we do on radio, print, and television uh, present ourselves as analysts, and we try to deal with the facts, and then we use those facts to bring the knowledge we've acquired over the years as reporters or scholars or diplomats or government officials, we use the knowledge we have to analyze those facts and give a perspective. But the moral dimension, the ethical dimension, has now emerged, in my judgment, in Ukraine. Uh, my piece is called The Silence of the Hawks. Atrocities in Ukraine being committed by the Kiev government with the full backing of the United States. I detail those atrocities, which began in May uh, people will remember the burning of some 40-plus people in a building in Odessa, but that was only the beginning. And now we have an all-out campaign by Kiev, and every day the State Department says it's okay. The State Department has no concerns about civilian casualties. The bombing of these eastern Ukrainian cities. Uh, it's not okay. Uh, all of us over, I don't know, 40 or 50 remember that we, pictures of cities being bombed in other countries. And when you bomb cities, you kill innocents, including old people and women and children. There's no way to avoid killing people when you begin to mortar, shell, and bomb cities. And the Ukrainian government has been doing that now for weeks on end with the literal stated, repeated okay of the White House and the State Department. Now we come to, and, and, and at the end of my piece, I say, that because the American media is not reporting, are not reporting these atrocities, uh, most Americans are being shamed by <clears throat> their government unknowingly. Most Americans don't know what's going on. But there are a lot of people who know in the universities, in the media, uh, in government, in the think tanks, know, and they remain silent. And I end my piece by saying that anybody who remains silent is now complicit. Uh, I feel that way. That's my own view. Now we come to the analysis. Last week, as you said, they recently elected, not entirely democratically, because the Southeast didn't vote. And the reason they didn't vote is Southeast Ukraine was not permitted to have a presidential candidate in effect. Uh, they beat them up when they tried to go on television debates. But it was a semi-democratic, and they got themselves a president. And last week he announced, uh, I think originally it was something like a three-day ceasefire that Kiev would stop firing on these cities, and the people who call themselves self-defenders would stop shooting down planes and fighting back. It semi-worked. 
skirmishes continued, people continued to die, but there was a real de-escalation of violence. And the Europeans and Putin were on the phone encouraging this to continue and extend it. And Poroshenko did extend it, I believe, to this past Sunday. And then uh, yesterday, or Tuesday, Monday, he announced the ceasefire was over, and he was going to what he calls Plan B, that is an all-out assault. So as we talk, several eastern Ukrainian cities, particularly but not only Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, Lugansk, are under, and these are cities that range from 150 to over a million people, are under full-scale bombardment, shelling, well, maybe not full-scale, but heavy, so that, as you reported, you know, electricity has been uh, terminated in many of the cities, there's very little water, food supplies are declining, essential medicine is declining, and people are fleeing. Uh, the numbers now range, according to the UN, approaching a couple hundred thousand, about 150,000 in Russia, 50,000 running elsewhere in Ukraine. But within weeks, this is going to be two, three, four hundred thousand people. So a humanitarian crisis. Now, to end this story analytically, we know that Putin was on the phone with the European ministers uh, prior to the end of the ceasefire, and they, that is Russia and the Europeans, the Americans were absent, urged a continuation of the ceasefire. Poroshenko did not. He ceased the ceasefire, but Poroshenko lacks any real power of his own. He depends on the backing of Washington. So evidently, Washington approved of the end of ceasefire, and that is where we are today with America. Whatever your listeners think about who was responsible for the Ukrainian crisis in the beginning, or however they think it should be resolved, no American should sit quietly while an American-backed government bombs cities over what is essentially a political dispute. Because after all, no one in those cities has ever attacked anybody outside those t- cities. They call themselves self-defenders. And they are self-defenders. They're defending their territory against Kiev. It's a civil war at best. It's something worse at worst. There is a darkness ahead as you can hear the conduct of the kiev national guard right now is uncontrolled they didn't shoot down that sukhoi 27 because it was on a stroll over eastern ukraine so the defenders have something in the way of a defense of weapons they don't have the major weapon systems we see we can see uh, tank farms out there driven by the kiev national guard and what i'm pointing to is that the self-defenders do not have major weapon systems. They do not have columns of tanks, but Russia does. So here, Steve, before we end this first segment, and we'll come back to uh, your very careful recitation of the atrocities since May 2nd, and the remarks by the Kiev government, including the Prime Minister, that are unacceptable political discourse. The the, what is looming over this, Steve, is that there are armored columns, and they're Russian armored columns, and they would be riding to the rescue right now of the people of eastern Ukraine if that happens. And the U.S., if it is supporting Kiev, is taunting Russia to intervene. You said it. And it's certainly, it is certainly one explanation of, of the White House's behavior. I can think of others. But one possibility is a decision has been made to provoke Putin yes. into intervening in Ukraine, which would be a pretext to send American NATO troops into Ukraine. And that would be war between the United States and Russia. And also Sevastopol. They're talking about putting NATO troops into Crimea as well, if it comes to that. And that would also be a provocation well, for but a that would, Wait a minute. That would be an invasion of Russia, because Crimea is now part of Russia. I see the item tonight where Russia is warning NATO not to think about putting troops into Crimea. But so there, So it's part of the conversation. If part of the provocation, I would formulate it like that. That that I had not heard that report, but if there, if anyone in any position that's semi-official has put that out, that means that some people really itch for war with Russia. When we come back, we'll go through these provocations of massacres that have been building. The Kiev forces know this for weeks, and so do the people in eastern Ukraine. They know all these incidences. We'll start in Odessa, and then we'll talk. We'll, we'll point to the language of the leaders, men we've blessed, the, 
the Prime Minister of Kiev of Ukraine right now is created entirely by the United States by Victoria Nuland of the State Department. His name is Yatsyana. We'll talk about his language when we come back. Professor Steve Cohen, New York University and Princeton University Russian History Emeritus. I'm John Batchelor. <laughs> 